Hello, everyone. Welcome to the House of Torah. Today, we have a very great opportunity to meet Mr. David Miller. And actually, it's a very comprehensive person, and I would like to give a little bit short introduction with who we're going to talk today. So David Miller is actually the dog enthusiast all his life and successful sidewood breeder and exhibitor. And David Miller is one of America's well-known love judges. I want to highlight love judges, having officiated around the globe at some of the most prestigious dog shows. As an educator by profession, David Miller has combined his two passions of teaching and dogs and is globally known for his canine lecture series, which are very highly in demand. A brilliant mind combined with the enthusiastic dog person makes for a very interesting and educational person to chat with, and you will see today, uh, for every of us, of every canine enthusiast. And David is also a very keen photographer, and his work has been published internationally. So, hello, David. Hello, how are you? Well, I'm great, I'm great. So if you don't mind, let's start from the very beginning. And can you briefly tell us your introduction to the world of pedigree dogs? You know, how did it start? It? What kind of breed it was? What attracted you to those breeds and etc.? Well, it's a long story because we're gonna go way, way back to, you know, when I was born, my mother had chihuahuas. Okay. And uh, my father was vested in, in, in uh, American saddle, uh, saddle bred horses. And throughout life, we had various terriers and so on and so forth. I think the, the uh, very start of the canine knowledge that I gained and started learning was happened in the 70s and um, I, I was going to school in France and I saw a hound that I truly loved and that was a Saluki and um, I always kept that image in mind and when I finally came back to the United States um, I wanted to get a Saluki and uh, but I had an employer that um, bought me an Afghan hound and just like a lot of other dog people, I had one Afghan hound, then all of a sudden I had two Afghan hounds, and I had three Afghan hounds, and that, and um, my uh, guiding force, they gave me direction in my life, something to take care of, and um, they did many things for me, and I did many things for them, and, and then I came back, that's when I was living in, uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and then I moved back to Ohio to my parents' home and uh, uh, started showing the, uh, the Afghan hounds and that, and then um, got interested in Salukis. And from there, I uh, went to California. I, we had, was very, very nice place to live in Ohio because we had an excellent, excellent Saluki breeder by the name of Esther Bliss Snap of Pine Paddocks fame. And she was the one that really put Salukis in advertising and making them a breed that was known to the United States. And I saw Esther and, and I looked at her dogs and she wanted me to purchase a, a Kuwaiti uh, Saluki bitch, but I couldn't show that dog because it didn't have an AKC registration. So therefore, I went to uh, another breeder in California and bought my first Saluki. And like all dog people, you go ahead and you take things in steps. You get your first blue ribbon. You get your first points. You take best of breed or you go ahead and you finish the dog with majors. And I was hooked. And from then on, I went ahead got more Salukis and, and things like that, and started learning about the breed. And that's basically where I started and how I started from an early age of, of uh, being around dogs, being around horses, and getting into dogs full-fledged. Okay, so I think that 
you know, one tip that we can provide to our listeners today is that you need to be very patient and everything you're supposed to do step by step. Nothing yes. is happening in, you know, next day. You have yes, to things don't happen overnight. And then, you know, you enter the dog show world, you find out, oh my God, there's a whole different language to learn. Yeah. There are whole different things to see, to understand, and that's just about dogs itself. Then there's that whole other information about trying to navigate through dog shows. What do you have to do to make a champion? So on and so forth. It's just a whole new world. Yeah, yeah, and many things to learn. Great. So, yes. you know, like being a person and uh, educator by profession, as far as I know, right? When you right. judge dogs, is it just about finding the best breeding prospects or it's about helping to develop it and keep this activity alive and fresh with the new blood? How do you contribute to this? Well, you know, that's a very good question. And the thing is, dog shows essentially are judging breeding stock. We have to be cognizant of the standard and we have to, in our perception of the standard, put up the best dog. Right. Now, in that, if you have a youngster that walks in your ring and may have a little difficulty showing the dog, but if that dog is a very good dog, you cannot deny it. Yeah. Therefore, we're helping, we're helping the youngster too in, in order to get that that wish and want to continue in dog shows, which is very, very important because in some clubs we're an aging uh, community and we want to bring in the new blood. The, the thing is, is that we have to learn to cultivate the younger people. And the reason why I find this is a good question, the American Kennel Club has set forth some very, very good programs. First of all, for children that are, I believe, five to nine years old, we have what is called the Pee Wee program. We have a certain time that we set aside at the dog show and we let these young kids come into the ring and with the help of their parents and that, show their dogs. And every single child that comes into the ring for the Pee Wee program gets a gift and that, and they like it because they feel a part of the whole thing. That's very nice. So then we have the junior handling. And junior handling is like junior handling throughout the whole world. FCI, American Kennel Club, uh, Canadian Kennel Club, uh, the Australian Kennel Co Council all have their, their uh, junior showmanship programs. Uh, what our particular club does in order to foster the interests of, um, of the younger crowd is that we have junior memberships and we allow them to become a, a full member and a voting member uh, within our kennel club and that and get them involved so they can see the process of putting on shows, what goes on, learning about dogs, attending different seminars, and this is definitely their interest and it's proven to, to help. In our club, we have several junior members. And um, that's great because, believe me, I've been president of the Grand River Kennel Club for about 17 years. I've been the show chairman of the Grand River Kennel Club and also president of the Cuyahoga Valley Hound Club. And when voting comes, when people say, who wants to be show chairman, I see no hands going up. Yeah have to get these young people vested in the sport and these are just some ways that we do it we can't do it basically a hundred percent why we're in the ring judging but what we need to do is give everyone a fair shake in that ring and believe me if it's a young person of nine years old and they have the best dog and there's no question, they go up. And hopefully, that spark right there when they win and the people outside the ring start clapping, it gives them a sense of, I belong, I want to continue. Wow, wow, that's really inspirational. 
you know, I'm just, uh, I didn't plan to collect the tips, but now I see that, you know, we have like, and the kind of the second tip is that you kind of supposed to have like a mentor, like someone who, you know, brings you a little bit more deeper in the technology, deeper in the things you do, you know, there is always ups and downs, but still you need to, you need to have a joy and someone has to lead you to the, to the road you go. Exactly. It's, it's, it's really inspirational. I am really glad. Uh, okay, fine. So, you know, let's go back a little bit to the, to the dog shows, you know? So, like, dog shows, uh, is it like now moved from assessment of breeding stock to more the trophy collectors and ranking chasers, you know, that everyone's, everyone wants to have a little bit more champions, more high in ranking? Do you agree with this? Or what do you think, if you agree, what caused this? Well, this is a very, very difficult question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. And I'm glad to answer it. Now, I'll answer it in the best way I can. Yeah. Certainly, we have a sector factor, whereas people want to win. Yeah. And I believe, and it's in my heart, that if you have a good representation of your breed, you should be able to win. The day when that stops is the day when I will stop judging. Simply because, yes, there's an element where we find that sometimes the best number one dog in a breed to concerned breeders is not the best dog. Mm -hmm. We have a section of people running to that number one dog and wanting to breed to that dog. And then that number one dog is going ahead in its get producing the same faults that the breeders feel that are not typical of the breed. That happens. But it happens in a, in a lot of facets and a lot of sports concerning animals. But I want to tell you a little story. you have time for a story? Sure, go ahead, please. Wonderful. You know, I was, I was honored to be able to judge the World Dog Show in Shanghai. Mm. And I put up a very, very nice Pomeranian had a beautiful entry there. And I gave him best of breed. He went on to take group two at the World Dog Show in their particular group because China's FCI. And jokingly, I said to the person, you know, at my dog show in the United States, we have a Pomeranian supported entry. You should bring the dog over and see if you can finish his championship there. Well, not thinking anything would ever occur of that. And getting ready for the shows and being show chairman, you're occupied with a hundred things and putting out a hundred fires here and there and whatever. Who walks past me is this young man with the Pomeranian I had put up at the World Dog Show. Well, the first day at the show, the dog goes in, he's not a champion, he goes in, wins winner's dog, takes best of winners and best to breed over the champions. Okay. Well, I was just elated. I was so I was so happy for the individual because the individual traveled all the way from China here, and of course, that's not cheap. Yeah. He goes into the group ring. He takes group one. I am standing outside of the group ring with my jaw just hanging open because I was so surprised. Now here is an animal, a Pomeranian, that is of exceptional quality, exceptional. And he was able to do this. This is something an average dog show person would only dream of doing. The dog goes into the best in show ring, wins best in show, 
not being an American champion, not being known, I said to myself, I have a renewed faith in dog shows. The next day, the same dog did the same thing. Best in show. He became a champion that weekend. Third day, he took a group three. Fourth day, he took a reserve best in show. I was literally in shock, but a good shock, knowing that a good dog, a nice representation of the breed won. But when that day stops, I don't want to continue because then I know that the dog show sport is only reserved for people who have a lot of support, a lot of money behind them, so on and so forth. And I'm not saying that people who have a lot of support and a lot of money behind their dogs are campaigning dogs that are not worthy. In the majority, I believe they are, but some aren't. And this is just the way the world is. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered that question okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, but uh, if we go back... And if, if I could just interject this one thing. Yeah, go ahead, the young man went to Westminster Mm-hmm. Year. Show the dog took best of breed. Then he had to go up to Canada to do some, uh, uh, visit some Pomeranian breeders. Then he went down to Louisville to the Pomeranian National Specialty, took best of breed. This is a dream, and it's a wonderful dream for the sport. One thing which catch my mind is that you call it sport. You know, it's not used to it so much, at least at least personally in, in, in my vocabulary that we call it, you know, like mm -hmm. shows, we call it like events and you call it as a sport. It's very different uh, and very interesting approach. Okay. So it is an approach. And if I, if I may just interrupt you for a second, so everybody knows and the viewers know, in the United States, dog showing is the second oldest sport in the country. After? The first oldest sport was the Kentucky Derby. Okay. Dog showing, the Westminster Kennel Club in, I believe it was either 19, or excuse me, 1887, uh, Westminster Kennel Club had the dog show and from then on that was the second oldest sport in the united states and only preceded by like two years by the kentucky derby so this is why we call it a sport and it is when you look at it it is a sport simply because um you know there's in all sports and all, all something serious it's it's a multi-million dollar enterprise everything that's associated with it and the sport itself. Yeah, true, true. But you mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned about the very early days. And I know that you by yourself, you are a few decades already in, in kinology. So can you tell us about what was the best era in dogs? Like oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I am sincerely hoping that this era is going to be the best era in dogs, but looking back, you know, 1960s, 1970s, I think were, were exceptional. Uh, to the case in point is that, let's take Afghans, for example. Back in the 1960s, 1970s, you had entries of Afghans at an average show being around 70 dogs. We don't have that anymore. Oh, really? And, um, I think that was the heyday when a lot of people were very genuinely vested in, in the sport. But, you know, life in America, and I, as I see it, life uh, also in the European countries, except for countries that uh, don't have severe legislation and zoning and things like that, and communities where you're only allowed to have certain number of dogs, 
And way back then in the 50s, 60s, when you had kennels that were very, very established, but uh, through the injuries of time, uh, these kennels just died out because the people who owned them died out and that, and it was very difficult to restart something of that, that, uh, that scale. So, um, yes, I think the 60s and 70s were, were a heyday in dog shows in the United States. And I think possibly in Europe, too, as well, because I remember in the 80s, uh, there were lots and lots of uh, dogs in Europe. But the European scene was a little bit different. The European scene was a little bit more convivial. Whereas you would go there as a family, you would have a picnic, you'd show your dogs, and it was a family affair and things like that. And uh, it was a wonderful scene. And people got together and talked and, and this and that. And uh, you had a lot of that. But uh, I see some, some apparent changes in, in the FCI countries as well especially in the number of dogs being shown and, and so on and so forth. But FCI still remains a very, very huge canine organization and canine event because they have a lot of dogs that are being entered uh, at their events. Okay. You know, um, I'm still, you mentioned about US and you mentioned about the Europe. But uh, like, you know, like you said, 60s, 70s, what about the Asia? It's also, I mean, from my understanding, it's very fastly growing part of the world in terms of kinology. Mm -hmm. What would you say about the Asian, Asian dog shows? Well, I'll tell you exactly what I've tell the, the judges that I've had in my seminars. Okay. Uh, I remember the first seminar I gave, um, I think it was in Nanjing, I gave a seminar on whippets. And uh, Frankie Loom, uh, who went ahead and organized all these seminars for everybody, because uh, I believe that he is a total visionary uh, for the Chinese uh, Kennel Union. Um, I told them, I said, you know, the people in this room, what I expect is that in three, four, five, ten years, you will double and triple, and they have. Yeah. Asia is the next great frontier of canine interest in the world. I see them spending a lot of time in facets that sometimes the American Kennel Club doesn't, doesn't address, which is grooming and grooming competitions. Uh, but I see added interest in their shows uh, and in developing Asian handlers, developing Asian judges, and so on and so forth, that I, with the quantity of people that you have in China, you have in Asia, and with the work that the Chinese Kennel Union has been doing, in order to teach the populace about good dog ownership, training, so on and so forth, has led the way to now certain legislation in China, whereas the negativity of the Chinese uh, and the Chinese culture in relationship to dogs is dwindling. Yes. Yeah. It's working and I see great hope for that country and for Asia totally. Okay, we, you know, we have quite many members in our group on the House of Toro from Asia, so I think it's very- Oh, you do? Okay, well, I give them lots of credit and my heart goes out to them. Okay, we will, we will write this in the comment for sure. Good. To highlight the 16 minutes of our conversation. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, the question comes uh, about, you know, if, if, if someone new are coming into the sport, I would call it sport, what the advice or some key points you would like to give it to them? Be still, watch, and learn. Listen, 
and not accept everything. However, you must go through a learning process. Nothing will happen overnight. And if you're serious about it, then you'll be successful because you'll be able to focus on certain things and that, you know, I'll tell you a story a long time ago. I was very shy, very, very shy. Okay. And you probably could tell right now I'm pretty shy, but I just sat and looked and I didn't talk very much, but I wanted to absorb around me and people thought I was stuck up, but I was in the process of learning a new world. And when you start being put in a new world, it's best to just observe and watch and learn. Mm -hmm. Observe, watch, I will make a note, watch and learn. Uh, yeah, I think that these are, this, this is very important, important topics. And again, going back to the first tip to be patient, right? Just to be patient and focus on what you right. do. Right, exactly. And you have to be patient. Yeah. It's very important. You know, uh, there is a very popular book nowadays that uh, really many people are reading. It's, it's, it's not about the dog, but the, it, the name of the book is From Good to Great, right? So okay. what do you think? If, if, if we talk about the exhibitors and the breeders, uh, how can we go not only for being just good, and constantly producing the very high quality dogs. How, we, how they could do that? Well, again, that's a process. And you, it's a learning process. And um, you need to have certain learning tools. We talked about mentors. And um, Mentors are very, very important, but in my seminar that I, uh, that I give in, in tribute to Richard Beauchamp, which is a, was an AKC judge and a very, very high profile person in the American dog show scene, unfortunately, Richard is not with us anymore, and that's why I went ahead and uh, damped his seminar, so to speak, and give it in his tribute. Um, we talk about mentors and how to choose a mentor that is viable and resourceful. And you just don't go running to the great one-time winner. You have to go to the people who have been established in the breed, have proven themselves in the breed, that have had several champions in the breed, and uh, go to them for a long logical interpretation. These people usually know their breeds very well and know the faults of their dogs and so on and so forth, but who are willing to take the time and share with you. That's very, very important. You just don't go to everybody. You go to somebody that has a proven track record. That's one way to start learning about breeds. Second is a very valuable book right here. And this book is called Canine Terminology. And when you go through this process of learning and wanting to breed good dogs, you need to know the terminology. And as I said before, you walk into a dog show canine world that you are learning a new language. And the language is right in here. And this is going to make you uh, more understanding of dogs period, and certain parts of dogs and so on and so forth that is essential to know if you're learning about dogs, if you want to be a judge, so on and so forth. You talked about breeding of dogs, and there's really only one book that was given to us many years ago and, and suggested to us by a very uh, well-known uh, canine judge called Mrs. Ann Rogers Clark, and she told us that we should go and get the book called Dairy Cattle Judging Techniques. Dairy Cattle Judging Techniques. You can see this on Amazon or perhaps uh, Vince Hogan of our dogs 
has this library and is willing to willing to share. But it's by George W. And I should put my glasses on so I can read his last name. George W. Trimberger, T-R-I-M-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E and this will give you, even it's talking about dairy cattle, the same methods apply to canine knowledge. That's another thing you can look at. So it's a process of when you're breeding dogs that you have all of these incorporated and to know and to explain and validate what you're doing in that breeding program or just learning about dogs. Because we can sit outside the ring and we can say, boy, I really like that Irish setter over there. But we have to have the information of why we like that Irish setter. And in order to make our information validated, we have to know about that breed and the standard. And that's another thing to do. The standard must be learned in order to be able to speak in a confident tone about a dog. Okay. Yeah, very valuable information regarding the books. We need to 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 tag Vince Hogan and ask him to to share with us the the, the copy of the book. Uh, but you know, you talked about the mentorship still, uh, and we are still getting back to the same topic. And it's very curious. I think also for our listeners, it's very important to understand. Okay, I understand that they need a mentor. Uh, you mentioned very important question: how we can find that mentor, right? You said that, you know, you can, you know, if he is very professional, he's breeding very nice dogs and he has a lot of trophies, you can go and talk with him and ask for his help, right? So this is one way. Is there any other ways how we can find the mentors? If you go to the website of the breed of dogs, now not all websites will have them, but for example, if I wanted to learn about Welsh Terriers, okay. go to the Welsh Terrier Club of America website. And there they should have a list of breeders and look under education and find the list of mentors oh. and these mentors are approved by that organization and that would be one way to go ahead and do it now there are, are other people who are just very famous for example if you wanted to learn about beagles you would go one of the world's authorities andrew brace in england send them an email See what he has to say, and I'm sure that he would share his knowledge. I can remember one, I, I judged the European dog show in, uh, uh, the European show in Bucharest, Romania, and I knew he was going to be on the panel. And I bought his book, and I went and I asked him to go ahead and sign the book for me, which he did. And I'm sure if I had any pressing questions about beagles, I could go to him and talk to him. Now, his beagles may be a little bit different than the concept that we have here in the United States, but this is a man that is very well versed in the breed. Same thing with other breeds. You find somebody who is famous in that breed. Now, famous, how do they get famous? Because they have a proven track record in the breed. They haven't been in the breed two or three years, and like some people, 
And I'm just saying some, they know it all. Believe me, I've been in Salukis for 40 years. I'm still learning. And everybody else is still learning that's been in the breed. But they also have an accumulative knowledge. And that's very important to discuss these things with these breeds. You come into the, the trap sometimes when you talk to people looking for mentors. All they want you to do is see their dogs and they have what we call kennel blindness. And you have to be able to be savvy enough to know when that happens. But if you go to somebody who is very reputable, then they will be able to give you a good, honest opinion and approach to the breed. How we should approach, I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit more to details, but sure, that's fine. This information, probably many of, uh, of our members, they would like to know, okay, how should I approach the mentor? What shall I say? Because if there's going to be like hundreds a week approaching me to be the mentor, right? I would say, I don't have a time. It's, 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 I can, I can, my values is to help, but I, I cannot help. How to hook up that he would really like to mentor me. Is there any tips and tricks there? Well, you could have, if you know somebody else in the breed that is, is reputable in the breed, and you say, look, at, I would really like to speak to this person. Could you introduce me? That's one way. For example, I was at a show, and one of my former students shows up at the show. They have a Vizsla. And they're new to the whole thing. And uh, I know one of the important and proven Vizsla uh, uh, people, Mrs. Miklo. And I said, said, I'm going to get you in contact with this person. And I walked over and introduced them. And she was gracious enough to go ahead and say, if you want to come over and see the dogs, I'll be more than willing to go ahead and discuss these dogs with you. That's one approach. But then, you know, the thing is, in this, in this sport, people who are reputable and vested should be able to tell if somebody is sincere and really wants to know about the breed. And the person who wants to know about the breed needs to be humble and sincere. Yeah. And you get that quality in somebody who really wants to know about the breed, then I think any time is, is, a, uh, is a profitable time for both of you, because uh, you know the it's all this the most valuable thing that you can give a person is your time. Yeah. Okay. So you have to be humble and sincere, and then they will they will probably go ahead for the good decision, helping you or giving the mentorship. Great. Sure. Great. Uh, let's go back a little bit to the ring, <laughs> to the ring of the dog show. Uh, okay. Important, in your opinion, is ring craft, you know, and presentation whilst showing the dog. What percentage of importance, let's say, do you think it plays in overall picture? Well, I think a person needs to have sufficient control over the dog. Okay. In to catch the judge's eye and, and make a good presentation of that animal in front of the judge. Now, sometimes that doesn't happen. And sometimes you have to piece together that dog in order to give it a fair assessment. Mm -hmm. Now, in the American dog show scene, we have maybe three minutes to assess the dog. And if the dog is acting up and the, and the presenter, the exhibitor, doesn't have full reign over that dog, that can be a difficult task. And there have been situations in the ring where I've seen dogs destroyed by some of the handlers, but these dogs were very, very good specimens of the breed. And if they moved and I could assess the movement and I could examine that dog, 
that dog would win. However, you have to have a modicum of control over a dog. So ring craft, and you call it ring craft, I call it, I call it being able to show the dog in a reasonable manner. And, you know, we have professional handlers here in the United States who are, are wonderful. You have a few in the, in the, in the European continent and uh, they're able, to, their ring craft is very, very good too. And, uh, but you can't always, you can't always go ahead and um, say that the people who are professional have the best dogs at the end of the ring. Yeah. Or, I mean, at, at the end of the ring, but the end of the lead. Uh, so you have to judge everybody in that ring and everybody has a fair chance because they're paying the same money for that entry fee. So you owe them the obligation to judge their dogs. But craft is important too. And you have to, that's another facet of dog showing that you have to learn. You have to learn how to show a dog. So that's why I say you have to be very patient in this whole process because things don't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. How you long know, it, you, after breeding and exhibiting you decided to, to judge the dogs? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. How, how long after breeding and exhibiting you started to be a, a, a judge? Oh, okay, yeah, so I started in, oh, I would say 1972. Mm -hmm. to the dog shows it wasn't until 1988 16 years later that i well i'll tell you what happened i i was handling dogs uh for clients uh handling dalmatians and of course i'd had a dalmatian client on the east coast beth winnick and she would say david uh uh, meet me in Las Vegas because I've entered the dog in the uh, Las Vegas Dalmatian specialty. So I would have to get on a plane and go to Las Vegas and meet her and show the dog and so on and so forth. Well, I had a degree in uh, French literature and German language, which I wasn't using. And I also had a teaching degree and I had um, interviewed for some teaching jobs. And sudden I was hired and I couldn't get on a plane at any time to go and 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 uh, show a dog so I wanted to be, still be a part of the sport I was still breeding and and that but I wanted to be active in the sport so I at that time made my application to 51 Madison Avenue, New York, New York. And they gave me one breed to judge. That was Saluki's. Okay. My second breed to judge after a couple of years after that were Dalmatians. And that was a system where you had one dog. Then if you had one, then you could only for the next one one and then if you had two you could apply for two and you would have to advance that way that was way back in the 80s early 90s and that but um yeah it was it was 16 years that i was in the sport and and it was very interesting because i would start winning with my salukis people would see that and then they say would you show my dog and then i had a very nice um uh, he's no longer with us but uh his name was dr aza mays and Aza Mays was a uh, Borzoi Saluki breeder. And uh, he saw a Borzoi person and they asked him, oh, who could show our dog? And he mentioned my name. And that really started things off in that vein too. So, you know, I was, I love the sport. I wanted to stay in it. I wanted to be active. So I figured, well, why not go into judging? And that's how it happened. Okay, okay. but. What what lessons learned while you were a breeder and exhibitor do you think helped to make you a, a good judge? Can you identify some? 
Well, patience, um, being able to interact with people, uh, being fair. Okay. Because sometimes when you're an exhibitor, you feel that you weren't really looked at in the ring. And that always stuck in my mind. Because when you don't give somebody the same opportunity mm -hmm. as anyone else, then you obviously feel slighted. And I think that left a big impression on me. Um, being able to pose a dog sufficiently gives you the knowledge of the structure and anatomy of that dog because as a handler, sometimes you don't want to show the bad things about the dogs, you want to show the good things about the dog. Exactly, exactly. So therefore, you're able to know how to hide certain faults. But then again, as a judge, you have to know that hiding faults is difficult to do uh, because you have the experience of seeing people and you yourself doing it. Oh, okay. That, that, that comes into the picture. Um, but I think you have to be a very personable person because you're dealing with the public, you're dealing with the sport, and you're you're you you want the sport to to endure and flourish. And if you are not nice to an exhibitor or don't give them the time, you're just going to kill the sport. So th these are just some of the things that I, you know I've touched upon that that uh, pertains to your question. Okay. You know, but there are still, you know, we talk about all these nice things, but I think in the judge life, there is still something that exhibitors do, which really annoys you as a judge. <laughs> Please tell us the truth. Well, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Um, not being at the ring on time. <laughs> okay. You know, in the United States, we are governed, judge, judge, our judges are governed by what we call the American Kennel Club representatives. And we have a judging schedule that we must adhere to. And if you're not at that ring on time, or if you don't have a sufficient amount of people to help you bring dogs, if you brought a lot of dogs to, to uh, have the judge judge, and you have to run outside the ring and take three minutes to get the other dog and things like that. that that's a problem <clears throat> because it's going to affect your ring time. And that you can be criticized by, by the American Kennel Club representative. Okay. Uh, another thing, too, is the social media aspect, which is very interesting. Because, for example, if I'm going to judge a show, let's say, somewhere in Europe, and people see that, all of a sudden, I get this flock of friend requests. Uh -huh. well, that's always, always nice. And usually, it, it, right now, is if you don't have, if we don't have at least 100 uh, common friends, I will not friend you because I, I have, on one account, uh, nearly 5,000, and the other account, about 2,500. And I think these people are under the impression that I have the time to really absorb their Facebook page and learn about them, which I don't. And that this is going to give them an added edge, which it's not, simply because I'm judging their dog, not them. And their Facebook page isn't going to give me an indication of the qualities of their dogs. Yeah. You know, I think that's one thing that, that irks me. Another thing that irks me, and I'll be very, very honest with you, is that there is a sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. 
of some people that walk in the ring. They walk in the ring and they expect to win because perhaps of their record or so on and so forth. And when you're passing out the ribbons, and in fact, if they don't win or don't win an award that they like, then you can see it in their face. And I feel for them, but I've done what I believe is best for the breed. But the sense of entitlement has got to go. Okay. You know, you said you were going to mention one thing, but you mentioned three things, which annoys you. But <laughs> so it's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Very good. But you know, very good, but charm. <laughs> it's very good for our listeners, you know, to just to, to, to understand a little bit of the way the others are thinking about them, not only what they think about themselves. You know, it's 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 very, very clear message. I really like that. Uh, but mm. does the judges make the mistakes? And if you do, like if the judges make the mistakes, how do they deal with that? Well, I'm very hard on myself. And, you know, I'll do, I'm not talking about mistakes sometimes. I, And I'm going to address that. But sometimes after judging, I will relive that judgment and said, I'll say to myself, David, you could have done it this way, or David, you could have done it that way. And I'll sit there and relive it. But you must understand that every single human being makes mistakes. Now, there are two kinds of mistakes. There's an honest mistake that you can live with, that you can learn from. And that is the most important mistake. Then there are the dishonest mistakes that some people make. And those are what I call unforgivable. When you get a new breed, for example, in the American Kennel Club, a judge is liable or likely to make a mistake. And this is in the process of an evolution of the judge because we learn from our mistakes. Unfortunately, for the exhibitor, but we learn from these mistakes. For example, I'm a much better Boston Terrier judge now than when I first started because you start learning in that ring when you're judging and it forces you to go back to that standard and to really look at it and another thing too is you talk to breeders and you talk to many breeders and get a concept Sometimes organizations don't like us to talk to breeders or discuss placements or things like that, but you can't learn in a vacuum. You have to rely on breeders and their suggestions. And if a suggestion, if you've made a mistake and they come to you and try to focus you a little bit better in a constructive way rather than a confrontational way. Yeah. That's a good learning tool. But we all make mistakes. And any honest mistake is a valid mistake to learn from. Okay. You, you, you mentioned the confrontation. Uh, do exhibitors place too much importance of uh, the decision of a judge? Or like, do you think like, do you think long-term breeders often trust their own judgment of their own dogs? What would be your opinion? There are some long-term breeders who know their dogs very well. Yeah. Who will understand why a judge may have given it a third or a fourth rather than a first or a second. They know their dogs very, very well, and they are able to accept the decision. There are some people that walk into the ring, some breeders that may not know their standard in and out and feel that their award was not merited. Okay. 
you know, it's just a fact of life. That's the way it happens. So let me give you an example. You know, and this is why mentoring is very good in finding a very, very good mentor that really knows their dog specifically. I can remember years ago, I was giving a presentation to uh, an Afghan hound club not far from where I live. And I gave a test about the standard. Mm -hmm. And some longtime breeders failed the test. Now, that's telling me something right there. That could they possibly be breeding to the standard? Or not? And, and why it's very important to know the people who truly know their dogs. So yeah, there exist breeders who really know. Yeah. And exist breeders that really don't know. However, um, in the dog show ring and in placements, some are very, very gracious and accept what the judge does. Some are not as gracious. But that is in everything in life. I understand. All right. And um, let's touch a little bit different topic uh, regarding the FCI and American Association, right? So you are uh, one of the few American judges who judges constantly in uh, FCI countries. How difficult is to switch from the FCI from the AKC to the standards of F to FCI? And are they really so significantly different? Well, um, let me tell you how I prepare for an FCI assignment. What I do is I take a look at all the dogs that I'm judging and I go to my computer and go to the FCI site and I print out the breed standards. Okay. You have to be cognizant of the standard because you can make a fool of yourself. For example, let's take Dalmatians, for example. In the American standard, you're allowed blue eyes, which is a disqualification in the FCI standard. Okay. In the American standard, there is a height limit. Anything over 24 inches, 24 inches and over, is just a qualification. In the FCI standard, it's not a disqualification. There is a suggested height uh, specification in the standard, but anything over it doesn't say it's a disqualification. So, for example, if I went to Europe and I saw blue eyes and I put up a dog with blue eyes, I'd be in trouble. And the breeders in Europe would not like me very much. So I have to be very, very cautious. For example, another thing too is miniature pinchers. In the American standard, they're allowed a hackney gait. In the FCI standard, no, that is verboten. You cannot have that. So have, there are differences and you have to be aware of these differences. And you have to be not only aware, but I'm going to use the word respectful. Yeah. I must respect their interpretation of the breed. And I hope that when they come to the United States, they are respectful of our interpretation of the breed. That's the way the world works. Is there, uh, I, I understand that you have to adapt yourself and respect the, the rules and respect the system. Is there anything that you like and dislike very much on the FCI system when judging or you just respect and follow the, the, the requirements? I, FCI has been very good to me. Okay. The AKC has been very good to me. And I am an individual that needs to respect both systems. FCI, I find that has a lot of pluses that I like a lot. 
and that is being able to furnish a critique and give my views in relationship to the standard to the dog that is being presented in front of me. Mm -hmm. Therefore, an exhibitor, who cares, can interpret why I've made the decision that I may have made. Whereas in the American standard, or excuse me, the American system, we have a class of dogs, I judge them, I'll put them in order, send them around the ring and go one, two, three, four, that's it. And they have no idea as to why I have made the decision I have made. That is one area that is different from AKC and FCI. And I feel that FCI has a wonderful, um, uh, wonderful way of doing that. And not all FCI's re, uh, shows require you to make a uh, a critique. Yeah. Not all of them. Um, I don't know why it's not uniform. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the number of dogs that the uh, judge has to judge in that particular day, and I think the limit for FCI is eighty-five. But. Um, I think that's a, a good learning tool for judges who know what they're doing and have to put their reputation at stake when they make that critique. Now, there are some organizations in the United States, um, one in particular uh, is called the IABCA, I believe, that, that requires us to make a critique of the dogs. And it's a very small organization. It's not as as big and as reputable, or I can't say reputable, but as as uh, observable in the United States. But we do that for them, and I've judged several of their shows. Uh, but it, it's good for a judge to be able to verbalize. And the AKC now is wanting us to verbalize more and more in when they grant judges breeds we have to have an interview with the american kennel club representative and we have to go through the disqualifications of the breeds without any notes and also talk about the breed in an educational way well yeah i think that you know the critique is just my personal understanding but the critique is kind of the advantage especially for the exhibitors because they, they know the reason, you know, and if they want to improve, they know the opinion, they can listen, they can understand, and they know the, they know the why it happened like that, right? So, I exactly, and that, you know, that goes into the other question that you asked me, uh, and that is, is this breeding stock? Yeah. And what we're doing is assessing in that critique about breeding stock. Yeah. And that's important because you don't want to breed a dog with faults and perpetuate these faults. The whole atmosphere of a dog show and the whole purpose of a dog show should be the improvement of purebred dogs. All right, all right. Yeah, good to understand. You know, um, I think that uh, nowadays is, uh, is also a very strong kind of the anti pedigree dog lobby making and it's less politically correct to the own one, right? What steps do you think the Kennel Club should be taking? Well, the American Kennel Club has been very, very proactive in this uh, head and uh, have a legislative department, whereas they look at each one of the states and and zero in on legislation that is detrimental to purebred dogs or dogs in general. And uh, the individual clubs can therefore go ahead and uh, uh, ask for assistance from the American Kennel Club, as well as address the fact to the city authorities. For example, Minter, uh, where I live in Ohio, they wanted to ban all dogs that were associated with quote unquote pit bulls. And I went there and I talked to this 
a forum to the, to the uh, city fathers and I said to them, okay, fine, you tell me what your definition of a pit bull is and any dog that would be associated with that. They could not answer that. I told them, okay, if you don't have an idea of what a pit bull is and you go ahead and have that dog exterminated, are you prepared to have lawsuits brought against you? Yeah. And of course, they weren't interested in that either. And another thing I told them is that it is the sole responsibility of the people who own the dogs yeah. rather than the dogs or breed specific themselves. And um, the legislation didn't pass, thank God. So we have been proactive in that. But I think there is, we have organizations like PETA, which is, a, to me, a terrorist organization. And they have people who want to leave everything free and will go to dog shows and open up cages and leave dogs run free and, and all this. These are people who are anarchists and uh, they need to be addressed and addressed fully. Another thing is the fact that a lot of these dog organizations I ran into when I judged in China at the World Dog Show. There was a multitude of people that were against this and a lot of them were dog people and a lot of them were people who who were members of these organizations and my substantiation of me judging there was this is that boycotting doesn't do anything to a culture engagement does and we see because of this engagement in china that the canine world is getting better and that's what we want if we boycott it we let it go and that is not the way to attack the problem and i had to i would i, I had multiple multiple hundreds of emails of people against me saying you know really ridiculously bad things about me judging in china and so on and so forth which was completely ridiculous and uncalled for and i wrote a whole treatise as my defense of judging in china and i would just send them a copy of that but we have to deal with these people we have to educate them and some of them will listen some of them won't again that's life yeah yeah true definitely uh at the very beginning when i was introducing you to our audience uh, i mentioned that you are the lecturer right yes and your lecture on the the mysteries of breed type is very world famous i understood and has some exceptionally good um reviews it's like it's being very exceptionally educational can you share with some silent <laughs> uh, stuff points from your lecture that you know that we can understand what it's all about and um, to have some some tips for our yes. audience? I, you know i thank you for your 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 positive image of my my uh lecture on that um, Not mine. i just read the review i just did my journalistic job <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, I have to say that it is not solely my lecture. It's a lecture given in honor of Richard Beauchamp. And he's the one that wrote the book, uh, Solving the Mysteries of Breed Type. And basically, it zeroes in on five basic principles of how we assess breed type. And um, I've been very lucky in giving this presentation in Australia, in China, China, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, Singapore, the United States. Uh, and I probably forget, oh, India. India is where I first gave it, and that's where it took off. But um, 
we're looking at five basic things in, in the assessment of breed type. And a dog's character is one of them. Mm. Simple. An Oswak. An Oswak is a dog that is supposed to be rather feral. If they have an Oswak and that's jumping up on you and kissing you and that, that's not the character of an Oswak. And that, that, you know, and if you don't have a, a Cocker Spaniel that's tail is wagging and it's married, then that's not, if it doesn't have that, it's not the character of a Cocker Spaniel. Therefore, when we're looking at character of the dog, when that dog walks into the ring, or how it, how it uh, holds itself up, if it doesn't have that character, it's lost breed type. Right. Silhouette. Silhouette is another one. If the dog doesn't have the correct silhouette, then it could be confused as another breed. For example, a pug is supposed to be square. What happens when a pug has a long loin? It's the lost breed type. We look at heads. Heads are very important, especially the eye configuration, the length of the muzzle to the length of the back skull, so, so on and so forth. If the dog loses head proportion, and that, then the dog loses type. Yeah. Movement. If you change movement on a dog, the dog loses type. For example, if you have a chow chow that runs around the ring and has a tremendous kick in the rear, uh-uh, it's supposed to have that shuffling gait, which is being lost in the breed because a lot of people like a flashy movement. Mm. Well, another thing, too, and I, I always tell this story in my lecture, and I hope you have time to listen to this one. Sure, sure, go ahead, please. That is, I was in uh, one of the Asian countries, and there was a Pomer, or excuse me, a, a Pekingese. And a Pekingese, according to the American standard, should have an unhurried movement. Well, this Pekingese that was being exhibited to me moved like a sighthound. I was, I was totally baffled looking at this exhibit Moved like a sighthound down the back around the ring. It was just a sight to see. I'd never seen anything like that. I must have had that dog move five or six times because I wanted to say to myself, David, look at this because this is not right. And you may never see this again in your life. Of course, this dog, other dog, moderate, had a, a, a nice formation for a, a Pekingese, went into the ring, had a beautiful head envelope, so on and so forth, came into the ring. It wasn't as flashy and moved around that ring like a sighthound, but it was a peak and ease. So when you, ch when you change movement, you change type. Yeah. And then coat. For example, if a Labrador retriever doesn't have the right kind of coat, it's not a Labrador retriever, and it will die. In the climate they were meant to be in as a functional dog and we still want to have functional dogs so if it doesn't have the correct coat for the breed it loses type so these are the main things that we look at in the seminar and we talk about and um, that way we reinforce revisit certain things about certain certain breeds and how to assess these breeds mm -hmm. and then I have other certain things that we do because you know I don't like to talk constantly but let the audience talk and share their ideas and plus another thing too in education you know you you, you have to do I take the uh, Richard Beauchamp's book I take the book that I showed you canine terminology which I bring one copy of each to the seminar and I, in their folders, will put a certain thing in there to show them that they won that book. 
at the end of the at the end of the seminar. So you know you use educational techniques to make them form a template in their mind as when they look at a breed and to be able to recall certain things mm -hmm. easily, rather than having somebody just stand there and lecture, 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 which half the people fall asleep. And that's, that's the, that is the seminar in a nutshell. Well, thank you very much for these tips. So uh, we are running out of time. And uh, okay. I would say that this, our conversation, there is something special because people are looking to this and viewing these type of the conversations for the things that they would really can take it and bring it and start establishing it and in their own breeding or understanding or preparing for the shows, understanding their dogs. And I think uh, except those very important ones that we talked about the patience, that we talked about the mentorship that is really needed in, in, in the technology nowadays. There are many tips that people would be able to learn from this conversation. And I'm really glad that uh, we had a great time, great little bit more than one hour today. And uh, David, I would really like to thank you from on behalf of the House of Toro. Thank you very much for spending some time with us. Sorry that it was in the morning of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Late at night, but listen, Paul, it's for me to thank you for allowing me to express my ideas and for being able to share what I know from the years I've been in, in dogs. And I thank you for that opportunity. Thank you very much, David. So probably, hopefully, it, it was the first, but probably not the last time. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Viewers, enjoy, enjoy your day. Listen, you as well, and take care. And everybody in the audience, take care and do the best you can. Thank you, David. Goodbye Bye now. Bye.